Can a relatively unknown woman change the mind of one of the greatest and most influential writers who ever lived? Mrs. Eliza Davis proved that that was possible. Now you may not know her name, so I hope you'll tune in today and find out the story behind the woman who changed the mind of Charles Dickens. Hello, my name is Art, and this is the Bookshelf Odyssey Podcast. Today I'm going to be talking about the impact our words can have and how we need to use them in a positive way. Author Nancy Chernin recently wrote a book called Dear Mr. Dickens, and this is a story that everyone should read and pay attention to because uh, it has importance even for our world today, especially for our world today. During the Victorian age, Eliza Davis realized that her favorite writer, Charles Dickens, continued to write unfortunate stereotypes of Jewish characters. So she picked up pen and paper and wrote Dickens a letter explaining to him why this was, a ba- this was bad. His portrayals of characters like Fagin uh, and Oliver Twist and other Jewish characters like that that he had written were harmful to her and her people. And like I mentioned, uh, Nancy Chernin, an author, she's written this book called Dear Mr. Dickens, and it is a fantastic read with really great illustrations. And yes, it's a children's book, but I think adults should at least read it because words have power. And Mrs. Davis used hers to change the mind of one of the most stubborn men in the Victorian age. What can our words accomplish today? I believe still that our words can accomplish much. So um, let's go to that interview with Nancy Chernin to find out more about her book, Dear Mr. Dickens. On today's episode, we are exploring uh, the children's bookshelves, and I have a special guest on today. Her name is Nancy Chernin, and she's the author of many books, including the one that she's here to talk about today, Dear Mr. Dickens. Uh, This book was uh, debuted on October 1st of 2001. 21 and it's the winner of the uh, this is quite a list so i gotta i want to read this all because this is impressive it's the winner of the 2021 national jewish book award a 2022 sydney taylor honor book a chicago public library best informational book for young readers tablet magazine's list of best jewish children's books a mighty girl book and received a starred review from School Library Journal. It's the true story of Eliza Davis, a Jewish woman who wrote to Charles Dickens, criticizing his creation of Fagin and Oliver Twist, and asking him to create more sympathetic Jewish characters. It's a a beautifully illustrated book by uh, Bethany uh, Stancliffe, and it's been a part of a campaign to encourage kids to write letters to people in positions of influence, as Eliza did, asking them to take an action that makes things better in their community. community. So uh, with all that, uh, Nancy, welcome uh, to the Bookshelf Odyssey. Thank you, Art. It's, it's, really, it's really a joy to be here, and especially with a fellow Dickens fan like you. Uh, mm-hmm. I feel like you really get what I was trying to do here. Yeah. Uh, in, in fact, this Eliza Davis's her story came up in a recent discussion I had. Uh, we've been, uh, a few of us are doing a, like an online book club, and we're going through Great Expectations one of the chapters there's a there's a very minor character but it, it was a jewish character and it wasn't portrayed you know there was a, a kind of a negative stereotype about it and so i was able i said you know i remember there's a story of a lady who wrote to dickens and he changed and i couldn't remember all the details and then like a week later i come across your book so <laughs> like, oh this per- is what i this is what i was talking about yeah <laughs> no no perfect timing it, it's great that yeah. you had that in your head and this was I mean, her story was known to Dickens scholars, but I was just, it meant so much to me personally. I know we're going to talk about this mm. and I just wanted to share it in a way that I would have liked to have known the story when I was growing up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's a, it's a powerful story and the power of, of words and um, listeners of the show will know. I always ask about stories about words having power. And, and this is just a ex- classic example of, of what I'm, realizing is just the power that even one one letter can have or in her case a couple but yeah yeah tremendous but uh before we get too much farther i like to start off with asking my guests do they have a favorite book 
or sometimes it's more than one. <laughs> uh, but do you have a favorite book and, and, and why do you love it? Well, yes. I mean, I, I'm one of those difficult ones. I have so many favorite books and it's a different one on a different day. And of course, I mean, mm -hmm. Dickens, of course, is, is right up there. I mean, one of the greatest writers ever. I mean, I always have like his lines are always floating around in my head. Um, a Tale of Two Cities, you know, tis a far, far better thing I do than I have ever done. Tis a far, far better rest I go to than I've ever known. You know, Oliver T Twist, Great Expectations, such a great heart. But, you know, I was thinking also another writer that I have always loved so much and is so pertinent to these times is C.S. Lewis. Mm -hmm. I always feel like people don't really understand how large C.S. Lewis's heart was. And um, the book that people rarely refer to, the one that I actually loved the best, um, was The Last Battle. Mm. And um, there's such a powerful scene at the end of The Last Battle, where you have this uh, great, um, this great warrior named Tyrion, who goes at the end of days, um, and he has worshipped Tash all his life. Um, thinking that Tash was great and good. And at the end of the days, you know, you find out, oh, Aslan was the good one and Tash was the bad one. And he just like falls on the ground and he's like so despondent that he was wrong. And Aslan picks up and says, no, all the good deeds you ever did went to me. All the bad deeds people do go to Tash. It really doesn't matter what you call us. And, I, you know, I've gone back to that Sometimes I always go back to that because I always feel that sometimes people will do get hung up in um, with names, with who we call, um, you know, assume that if you say you belong to this group or that group or this or that, that this is right or wrong. And what really matters is the quality of our deeds and our actions. And it's always been a guiding post for me mm -hmm. um, where I try to. Um, you know, and I, I think it was also a connection from when I think about Eliza Davis and I think about Charles Dickens, she's a Jewish woman and he's a Christian man. And they found this bond because what they both cared about was charity and mm. doing good and helping others. So in a roundabout way, I mean, that, that guiding force of what really matters is the quality of how we treat other people um, mm. rather than even what we call ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, I always come back to that. Right. And uh, there's a line in your book. Uh, I'll try to, if I can remember it, it, it um, that Eliza says that it's um, that hi history will judge us and how we treat others. And man, that, that gave me pause to like, okay, I got to remember this is a children's book, right? But, <laughs> and I don't mean to say that in a derogatory way. I mean, I think there are some uh, very powerful, powerfully written children's stories and this is one of them that uh a, a line like that is really going to make you stop and think uh hopefully before you you act towards others well thank you so much and the kids are really connecting with it you know cool. I, yeah they understand that kids understand fairness and justice and i mean even if you're little and you're on the playground you're making those decisions all the time about how, to, how you're treating your friends or, or, or strangers and people you're just getting to know. Um, and I think that really connects with them. We learn it very young and we take those lessons into our lives. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my daughter is in seventh grade. So there right now, and she's kind of experiencing that of uh, hearing, you know, seventh and eighth grade is such a rough time and emotions are running so high with the kids and she'll come home and just be heartbroken because, you know, she had a friend who, who was talking bad about somebody else who, who was a friend of hers and, and vice versa. And you're like, dad, what do I do? How, you know, I just want them all to get along and be happy. And, you know, <laughs> like, well, you can only really control what you, you do and say, and, uh, and how important that is to, and how to respond in moments like that. Well, how yeah. wonderful it is that she feels she can come to you with those kinds of questions because, and you know, what that suggests to me is that you must've had good dialogue 
from very early on because mm-hmm. you can't suddenly have that when your child is in the teen years. Um, <laughs> usually it's something you've developed because you've been listening and you've been talking, and you've been discussing things and your child goes to you. So kudos to you for that and for having that conversation. And those are difficult conversations. Mm-hmm. I mean, what she's dealing with at, at the seventh grade level is something that she will actually deal with all her life. So she's mm-hmm. sort of learning the tools how to deal with these difficult situations. I mean, I still sit around as a grown person with grown children and I'm going, why are people treating other people in this particular ugly way? I mean, it's just, we're here for a short time. Why can't we be kind? Why can't we lift each other up? It, it's it's mm-hmm. perplexing. And all we can do is just try and model to do right ourselves, but also to model and to encourage. And one of the reasons I do like to write for young people is because I hope they will be thinking about those choices they make early on. Mm. Right. Right. So let's, uh, let's get into this, uh, talking about this book. Um, like I said, it's a, it's a, a, a children's story. It's illustrated, beautiful illustrations, and such a powerful, and, and it's a true story as well. And what I appreciated is from what I can remember from reading different biographies and things that um, you didn't have to embellish history at all. I mean, this is, this is a very accurate telling of the event that happened. So let's, let's talk a little bit about your, your writing journey to this. Uh, how did you become a writer? And then what led you to writing about this, uh, this particular instance in Dickens's life? Well, thank you for that great question. I would also like to say, even before I jump in, that this Mm -hmm. book has been vetted by three Dickens scholars. Mm -hmm. So it was very important for me to get it right. And actually it's dedicated to one of those Dickens scholars that was such a mentor to me. And I think that's why um, the Charles Dickens Museum in London has been so happy to create an educational program around it. I always, I wanted to be a writer as long as I could remember. I grew up in New York City. My mother is a retired, now a retired teacher. Um, my, you know, and she and my father always loved books. I was brought up in a world of books. I remember my favorite room in the house was the library where my mm-hmm. father had built um, uh, shelves from floor to ceiling, all packed with books. And I just couldn't wait to read as many mm-hmm. as I could. Later, my sister told me, you realize, of course, that was supposed to have been the dining room. I went, really? She says, yeah, mom hated cooking. <laughs> Dad was fine with that. So he just turned the dining room into our library. So that was funny. We'd eat in this little kitchen at this tiny little table, um, you know, we, you know, uh, and uh, and the dining and this former dining room became the library, which I absolutely love. But my mother read to me. Um, it was a favorite poem of mine, richer mm-hmm. than I, you can never be. I had a mother who read to me and my mm-hmm. mother read to me every night. She wanted to take off Sunday. So we did two chapters on Saturday. So, um, and, um, and the books that always appealed to me the most were the books that I think addressed the kind of people that we should try to be. You know, I, I think social justice always appealed to me. And I think that's one of the reasons I connected with Charles Dickens so much. And, you know, my mother always, any book that I wanted, she would she would get for me, you know, you know, Louise May Alcott, C.S. Lewis. And then Charles Dickens, who would seem like such a natural because of his care for social justice, she said, really? Charles Dickens, why do you like Charles Dickens? I said, oh, he has such a big heart and and he cares about kids and he cares about the vulnerable and these amazing stories, great characters. And she says, but what about Fagin? And you know, we're, my family, we're Jewish. Mm -hmm. My mother lost family in the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And my mother is a teacher. She understood the concept of windows and mirrors before people, other people were talking about them. She knew that in terms of mirrors, when you're a Jewish person and you look at Charles Dickens' books, you don't really see much that makes you feel good about yourself. And um, and in terms of, uh, you know, windows, you know, that, that image of Bacon makes people think very negatively about Jewish people. And that stokes anti-Semitism, which was a terrible, continues to be a terrible problem. But, you know, my mother had... had lived through the worst of it, even though she was born in America, she had family in, in Poland that suffered. Uh, mm-hmm. And 
were killed during the Holocaust. So this was a big issue for my mother and for me. But I knew there had to be more to the story. And I always wish I could I always wish I could have written Charles Dickens a letter. How could you have such a big heart for so many people and not for the Jewish people? Mm -hmm. Why are we left out of your great compassion? And so it was, but it wasn't until I was an adult and researching uh, on another topic that my mind drifted back to Charles Dickens, which it always did because I never lost my love for him, even though I was perplexed by this part of him. And I discovered Eliza Davis, that she had written the letter I had dreamed of writing. And at that point, it was like, I must find out more about her. I must find the full text of these letters. And that started a detective hunt. And that ended up leading to the book. She wrote the letter I had dreamed of writing. And not only that, she had changed his heart, mm -hmm. which is amazing. Yeah. So do we know about Eliza Davis, who, who she was, or do we only know her through those few letters that are remaining? Well, I tried to find out as much as I could. Mm -hmm. And there's not a whole lot there because she wasn't famous in her own mm -hmm. right. But I actually tried to use that to me, that actually even made the book sweeter because it's a sort of a reminder. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to be famous. You don't have to be powerful. That Eliza Davis was just like any of us. So the very fact that, you know, that she wasn't famous or well-known. I mean, she was, she was married. She was, you know, happily married. She had bought the house from Charles Dickens, Tavistock House. That's how mm. she first got to know him. Uh, she was born in Jamaica. Um, you know, the little things I found out about her that they they had children. So I used the little that I had to just try and make her more relatable, to make her more like, hey, she had the same three things we all have, paper, pen, and something to say. Mm -hmm. And Bethany Stancliffe, you mentioned how wonderful her illustrations were. Well, Bethany is a young mother. And she related to it too, because she thought Eliza was like, Bethany related to Eliza because like Eliza, Bethany wants to leave a better world for her children. So mm -hmm. she felt that this was like a mother wanting to leave a more fair and just world for her children. And that's one of the reasons she would speak up. Eliza in some ways doesn't seem like your typical hero, you know, uh, in, in that sense, you know, she, she, uh, she's a mother. She's like you said, not famous, you know, not that there's anything wrong with that. I mean, many of us are not famous, <laughs> but it, it's, it's, it shows the the power of what somebody can do when they feel passionate about something and then they speak up about it and, and to do it in a way that is not just yelling and screaming. You know, we've had, I think enough of that these past couple of years. And it's almost like she just approached it with a voice of, of compassion and reason and just to say, you know, I, I'm a big fan, but what you, how you portray my people is very hurtful and here's why. And I think as you point out that, you know, Dickens's response to her at first was, you know, well, that's ridiculous. But then, you know, she says uh, that, that there are some Jewish people who are, are criminals, but in your story, all of them are, are criminals. And that's the problem. Absolutely. And, yeah. and, and many people say that, that um, Fagan was, was probably inspired by the character of Ike Solomons, who was a real Jewish criminal at that time. Mm -hmm. But as you said, that that was the distinction that she helped him see that, um, yeah, it's it's not, I can understand you making a, a, a criminal who, who is Jewish, so yes. But again, as to, to repeat what you're saying, she said, she said to him, you're creating all your Jewish people are criminals. Like as, even as before we started the podcast, you were mentioning a Jewish mm -hmm. character and great expectations. And that was his world. That was his circle. You know, I don't think, you know, some people will have referred to Charles Dickens. They have assumed that he was anti-Semitic because they see all of these negative Jewish stereotypes. I don't actually think that was the case. I think that was just his circle. That's all he saw. And he didn't even know any Jewish people mm -hmm. um, other than these criminals that he read about or the money lenders. They didn't move in his circles at all. So she was an exception. Um, she and her husband had um, 
had bought his a house. He was trying to sell Tavistock house. And by the way, backstory, which is not in the book, mm-hmm. um, he confided in a letter to a friend like, oh my goodness, these Jewish people are trying to buy my house and I know it's going to be terrible and they're going to gouge me and they're going to be unfair. So all these stereotypes were stereotypes he believed because this was his association with the Mm -hmm. only Jewish people he knew. And then after the transaction went through and it couldn't have gone, he writes back and he said, he's almost embarrassed. He goes, wow, this is like the best business transaction I ever had. These are really nice people, very gracious, very fair, very generous. Mm -hmm. So I think he was taken aback by his own assumptions. And I think this is something that also happens when your society is segregated. Mm -hmm. You know, when your society is segregated, when you don't know people personally, from a certain group, it's very easy to tar them with a brush that assumes that they are all a certain way. And I think he didn't think of himself as being that kind of person who would stereotype people. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, interestingly, I mean, since you're such a Dickens fan, that happened also in in the case of um, David Copperfield, where he was about to make a villain of a character who is physically disfigured. And um, and that someone wrote to him who was close to me saying, you know, you make your physically disfigured person a, a villain, people will think anybody who has any kind of physical difference is a villain, that's not fair, right? And he did change mm-hmm. the nature of that character. So, um, but anyway, what Eliza did, she could have just sort of rested on the fact, well, hey, I have a nice relationship with him. But she took that next step. She says, I'm going to build on that. And I think he can do better and he needs to do better because everybody is reading him. And Hmm. she felt what my mother had felt that, you know, these words have power. And because he was writing about Jewish people this way, people in England, everyone read Charles Dickens from the chimney sweepers to the queen. Mm -hmm. It mattered so much. And he could have, she was taking a chance because he could have doubled down and done even worse. But you know what? He really was a good person, as I always believed. And he listened. Maybe it took a couple of letters (laughs) before he listened. (laughs) But he did listen. And he was fair. And he did do better. And the fun thing I would say, you know, you talk about this world now where we're all polarized and people yelling at each other. Mm. When he changed, notice how she admired him more than ever. She, there was forgiveness, not just forgiveness, but admiration. He has done the noblest thing that a person can do, Mm -hmm. which is to atone for a wrong. And that's, that's also in the, in the back matter. And I think we need to do more of that to give people room to change. And when they change, embrace that. Yeah. I I like that, um, that you pointed out that not only did he change, but he sought to make atonement for it, you know, by, not by not even just writing better characters, but going back and changing what was in Oliver Twist and not trying to make it not so obvious. That, I mean, that, that's a pretty, those are pretty big steps. And, you know, to me, the fact that he, it took a little bit of discussion before he began to see, I I think that points to just the genuineness of it. And it wasn't uh, just a, a reaction like, oh, okay, well, if someone's complaining, I might as well do uh, do something different. But that he actually thought about it, I think, and worked through that. He sure did. And, he, he, and the other great quality of his was that he cared more about doing right than mm-hmm. being right. I mean, there's some people I think who are so insecure that it's more important, like, oh, you know, don't question me. I'm always right. Who are you? I'm big and famous. You're a nobody. I don't have to listen to you. But no, he listened to everybody. And he really cared about what was fair and what was just. Um, And, you know, and and the fact that he changed, I just think it it speaks so well of him. And she appreciated him. Yeah. And even in his magazine, he wrote differently about Jewish people than he had before. And as I point out in the back matter, you know, you can't put this all like, you know, credit him and Eliza Davis for all of it, but really the attitudes of British people did change during those times. And mm-hmm. if you think about the history of um, how British people treated um, Jewish people, it had been terrible. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, they had expelled the Jewish population way before the Spanish did in the Inquisition. They had made Jewish people wear yellow felt badges long before the Nazis were known for doing that. And um, not all that changed so profoundly that England became the country of the kinder transport, the one that saved all the Jewish orphans. You know, Mm. and I think that also reminds us that Yes, what she just wrote was a letter, a couple of letters. But you know, every good deed is a ripple in a pond and you don't know how one thing can lead to another thing can lead to another thing. Mm -hmm. And I would say another thing here too. I think she was a profound and thoughtful reader of Dickens because you you and I also talked about this, Art, that, um, and I think she used his own philosophy to persuade him because her letter to him reflected the brilliance of what he had created in A Christmas Carol, which is the power of appealing to one's past, present, and future. Mm -hmm. And she truly appealed to his past by talking about his love for Ivanhoe, which had the beautiful Jewish character of Rebecca, the great healer, and the present about how we didn't reflect how Jewish people really were in that time and the future, how he would be judged by future generations like her own children. And I think because she spoke his language, that really helped him here. Mm. And that reminds us sometimes we have to meet people where they are. Yeah. One of the things that um, you come across when you read older books. Uh, I'm a big fan of the classics, you know, and, and Victorian literature, especially, but you, you often come across uh, points of view or <laughs> portrayals that are, are not really okay today, you know, and, and sometimes you have to show them a, a little bit of grace. I think, I think it depends on what exactly it is <laughs> that, that they're doing uh, or how, how they're portraying it. But uh, and, and some, for some of them, like you said, they just didn't know, you know, nobody took the time to tell them, Hey, this is wrong. You know, these people are living, breathing humans, just like you are, and they need to be treated with dignity and respect, just like you would expect. And as awful as it is to say, sometimes we, we need to be pointed out the obvious, you know, that don't treat someone like that, you know, and, and here's why, but yeah, I, I always, um, you know, some, sometimes it does make, make you uncomfortable reading it, but to me, it's, it's just a lesson to say, okay, this is what people used to think about this group of people or this thing in society. So how have we changed? Have we done better or can we do better? Um, and, and I kind of turned it into a lesson for myself, even just to be, remind myself of how far we've come and yet how far we still need to go sometimes. And even, and sometimes no matter how far we've gone, sometimes we slip back Mm -hmm. um, because it does require a certain vigilance. And I also come back to the fact that whenever you segregate and sometimes we self-segregate, I mean, sometimes it's not a a legal reason we're segregating, but we, you know, even like we can use social media to just sort of stay in our own little insular circles where we're not connecting with other people. And when you don't connect with other groups, I think you make yourself more vulnerable to believing um, generalization, stereotypes and falsehoods. And this is why it's always so important to have ongoing conversations and to talk and to see how much we all have in common. Um, And um, this is why I believe so much in in conversations, in in places for conversations. You know, for instance, um, I was a theater critic for many years. Mm -hmm. And one of the beauties of theater um, is that theater like books uh, is that they take you into a world where you're walking in somebody else's footsteps, you're hearing somebody else's story, you're knowing it for your own. Um, You are identifying with other people um, and you realize that, you know, we're all one human family. Mm -hmm. It's something I like to remind uh, kids of too, you know, because a lot of my books are about breaking down walls between people. And to go back to Bethany Stancliffe, you know, again, because I just absolutely adore the work she did here. Mm -hmm. But I I wonder, you know, I'm thinking about this last page she did. And this last spread, you have um, you have Charles Dickens in his home. 
And then you have Eliza Davis in her home. But the way the spread is, they are in their own separate homes, and yet it's one spread. So in the larger sense, we are in one world, even though they lived in separate places. Right? Yeah. And I like how the, the letters are floating through the air and they connect yes. the two pictures together. That's, that's they so connect good. us. Yeah. The words connect us. Isn't that true? Yes. I mean, and you love Dickens. Dickens takes you to, a, you know, to another world and you are connected with people who lived, you know, you know centuries ago. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, and feeling what they felt. Yeah, I've heard it uh, said many times that um, people who read a lot are more empathetic, that it something about reading fiction helps develop your empathy. And I think that's part of it that, you know, you're beginning to experience life in somebody else's shoes, which is what I think Dickens tried to get his readers to understand is, you know, even characters like uh, Oliver Twist. I know that some of it, that is character. Uh, he had some criticism with that because, you know, Oliver turns out to be, you know, from a rich family or wealthy family, you know, and, uh, but what he's trying to do is appeal to the people who are like that to say, Hey, I identify with Oliver. That's, that's the background I had. And look what happened to him when nobody cared. Uh, I, I better wake up here. Uh, and, and I think it still even points to the power of, be, of, of identity of being able to see yourself in literature, you know, and in stories in, in positive ways. Uh, which is Absolutely. what Eliza was writing about. Yeah. Absolutely. That, that is so true. And, and also you think about, so, and what was, and what did it lead to? Oliver Twist led to people changing the child labor laws. And mm -hmm. that's what he wanted. Well, I mean, Charles Dickens himself knew what it was as a child to mm -hmm. be, um, to have to work into that blacking factory and how horrible that was for him. Um, he had a tough childhood. Yeah. Um, a lot of people didn't realize that because he was successful at such a young age uh, through his books. But um, his suffering led him to to compassion uh, mm -hmm. for others. Um, and yeah, he did have a big heart. I, I, and I have to say, um, you know, I, I, I was telling you about how this had been an issue for my mother and me about mm -hmm. the, the character Fagan. I cannot tell you how gratifying it was to be able to have discovered the story and put this in my mother's hands. And one thing I have to tell you too, that was deeply emotional for me was that it took a, a great while for this to become a book. I first wrote it in 2013 because it's such an unusual story. I didn't really find a home for it uh, for quite a few years. And it came out in 2021. And by the time it came out, my mother had started to suffer from dementia. She was in the early stages of dementia. And I put, mm. his, put it in her hands and she just read it over and over. And it, it brought mm. tears to her eyes. No, it meant mm. so much. I have to tell you, Art, it meant so much because she was someone who would always turn to books for uh, to be lifted up, for compassion, and for her to have thought of Charles Dickens, this great writer as being so, has not liked Jewish people was so hurtful and painful because books had been a source of comfort for her. And this was a source of pain. And to see that he had been able to change and change other people's hearts as well. She just said, this is so important. This is so important. And then as the dementia started taking over her mind, she started to become confused and she mixed me up with Eliza Davis and she hmm. started to say to me, did, did Charles Dickens answer your letter? She thought I had written the letter. So hmm. I said, oh, it's all in the book. Just, just read the book and you'll see how he answered the letter. So, hmm. but he was the interesting thing. In a way it was like my, it was her letter, but it was like my letter she had written for all of us. She hmm. had written for all of us. And it, it was very healing. And I'm just so grateful I was able to put this in her hands. My mother is no longer able to read the book, mm. but she, I was able to get it in her hands in time. And I am so grateful for that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. The story continues to have power <laughs> and even affecting your life and, and those who read it. Um, and, and now you mentioned you've had opportunities to read it 
uh, to school kids and things of that nature. Um, so what do you do with that? How does that go for you? It's been really remarkable because, you know, the early resistance against the whole idea of the book was um, kids going to relate to an adult um, protagonist. Um, are they going to know who Dickens is? Um, how active can you make a book about letters? But the kids have really gotten it. You know, mm. I will I go and do a presentation and I will put all oh, I have 10 books out. I have more coming out next year. I'll put them out and the kids will point to this book and say, that's my favorite. Mm. They relate to it because the very fact that, um, that that there's power in speaking up, in writing a letter is something they can relate to because that's something they can do, too. They don't have to grow up. They don't have to be they don't have to be a grown up to write a letter. They can write a letter right now. They can speak up right now. It's a story about how their words matter. Um, yes, I've, I've already, I've read it to kids. I've read it to adults. And I've even through the Charles Dickens Museum in London, I've read it through their educational program that they have presented to, to London school kids. And it's just been wonderful. Mm. Um, and I'm hoping that it's going to inspire this whole generation to speak up, to write letters to people in position of influence. I actually have created a project called Dear Dot Dot Dot. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm hoping to start filling that up with letters and encouraging other kids to write letters too. Now, is, uh, is that information on your website? Absolutely. It's, it's on nancychernin.com. So it's just my name. Mm -hmm. N-A-N-C-Y-C-H-U-R-N-I-N dot C-O-M. And you can go to the uh, Dear Mr. Dickens page, which will have a link to dear dot 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 or go straight to the dear dot 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 page because um, that's, uh, that's the separate page I have. And I also encourage, especially your Charles Dickens fans, to go to the Charles Dickens Museum in London. And, um, and it's just such a wonderful, wonderful um, museum charlesdickensmuseum.com and uh and they have go to their educational programs and of course their program is spelled p-r-o-g-r-a-m-m-e um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's a wonderful program you know i've read all of the um uh i've read all of the handouts that they give for it and they they really encourage kids to see signs of um you know discrimination not just anti-Semitism, but any kind of uh, discrimination and ways of recognizing it and speaking up in a very, very powerful way. I think they were very happy to have this book because Charles Dickens was of such a noble character. And this was possibly the one blot, mm -hmm. uh, you, know, the, you know, the one real blot in, in his writing, but this addresses it. And the fact that Eliza Davis saw him as all the more noble for how he changed and how he spoke up for the Jewish community, I think it was something they were really glad for his fans and people who didn't know him yet to see. And um, the, Jew the fact that the Jewish community has also embraced this book, that it has won mm. the National Jewish Book Award, the Sidney Taylor Honor. This book has an opportunity to really bring the communities together the Dickens fans and the Jewish community, which had never traditionally been one before. Mm -hmm. So it's breaking down walls there too, which I think is lovely. Yeah. And, and I'm sure that the Dickens museum, like you said, is just ecstatic for something like this to engage children in, you know, and, and maybe create in them a lifelong love for his work and, and not just that, but in being better people in the long run, um, you can uh, impact somebody um, in more ways than just, um, Hey, I've got a new author. I like to read, but I'm becoming a better person because of what I'm learning through these stories. And, you know, that's a wonderful change that can happen. That, that, you know, that's always been my goal. And I think it's one of the things that I always admired about Charles Dickens. And I think that Eliza Davis admired about Charles Dickens, that he used his pen to try and make the world a better, kinder, more fair place. And I have to say that in writing this book and in all the books I write, the people I want to write, I'm going to leave it to someone else to write about the villains of the world. <laughs> and I'm not telling anybody what they should write about, but sure. I always want to write about the people who made the world a better place 
in the hope that it will inspire a new generation to do what they can to make the world a better place. That's what drives me. That's what inspires me. And I can see that in the children's eyes, that that lights them up and fills them up with a hope and desire to, to make things better. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the, this is the, you know, we're looking to the next generation to do better than we did. And I, I hope these books inspire them to want to do that. And I, I feel that it makes them, that, that, that it empowers them, that, that it helps them know that they can, um, because I don't want them to sit and admire what Eliza Davis did a hundred years ago. I want them to see how they can be the Eliza Davis or the Charles Dickens of their generation. Mm -hmm. How do they translate that into into our time and the future. These problems and things we're facing in our world, it can really be overwhelming, but to realize, well, maybe all I need to do is write a letter and I can do that. Maybe it'll have an impact. Maybe it won't, but maybe you'll encourage somebody else to write one and somebody else to write one. And then before you know it, um, change is happening and, and positive change is happening. Uh, but it, really that, that first step of, Hey, I can do that. I can write a letter or I can send an email. I can, <laughs> you know, Absolutely. I can tell, talk to somebody. Yeah. And and that's what I wanted. It's, it's just such a simple thing. I mean, it was just that she, again, she had the same three things that mm -hmm. Charles Dickens have and that we all have a paper, a pen and something to say. Mm -hmm. And whether it's a letter or as you said, an email or however we express ourselves, you know, some, some of us may express ourselves better with music or with art or with uh, with science or with social action, however you express yourself. But yes, we can all write a letter. And the other thing that I admired about her so much was that she persisted because that first letter she wrote to Charles Dickens, he went, who are you? Yeah. <laughs> what are you yeah. talking about? And um, and she just, she thought about, she could have backed off. She could have been really embarrassed. I mean, after all, when we hear from someone rich and famous that you're like, who are you? Yeah. You could just want to, you know, curl into a ball. But you know what? All of us have dignity. All of us have the right to be heard. Mm -hmm. And she knew she had a right to be heard. And she thought more deeply, how can I reach this person? How can I speak in a language he will understand? I mean, yes, we're both speaking English, but he thinks differently than I'm thinking. Let me enter into, and that's why one of the things, again, we talked about before we started, she actually uses the language and the themes of a Christmas carol. He was like being a Scrooge to her. Mm -hmm. And she <laughs> finds a way to reach to um, uh, reach to this Ebenezer um, yeah. by appealing to the past, the present, the future. You know, one of the funniest uh, reviews I've had, I've had many wonderful reviews of this, but one of the funniest was from a blogger who said, and she made like the ghost of Hanukkah, past, present, and future. <laughs> and I went, oh, that is so funny. Um, I, you know, great. I didn't think of that, but but I mean, how clever. Um, yeah. You know, so she 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 took what she wanted to say, but put it in his. When I say his language, they both spoke English, but in right. his understanding, using his themes, and sometimes we need to do that. I mean, one of the problems we have in this world are people talk at each other and not with each other. Mm -hmm. They don't try to understand each other's way of thinking. She truly did. The same way he did with his books. I mean, there was a reason everybody read Charles Dickens because he could get inside people's minds and hearts. She got inside his mind and heart. And then he was able to do that, take what he had learned from her and then bring it into, you know, as I said, his book, Our Mutual Friend, his first positive Jewish character, the kindly Miss Daria. That was because wonderful of character. Yeah. Wonderful character. And that might not have happened if she hadn't written that letter. You know, and unfortunately, you know, his life was, I think, cut short shortly after yes. that book. And, you know, to think what could he have done to continue that that trend of positive change? You know, what what matters, you know, he could have said. Um, well, to go to uh, Christmas Carol, there uh, one of the movie versions with Alistair Sim in it, because uh, this isn't in the book, but he has a line that I think is really powerful in that movie version where he says, you know, I'm too old to change. You know, he can't do it. He's too old. And, you know, Dickens could have said, well, it's too late now. I spent my whole life writing this and it's too old. It's too late. 
But even if it's just in one book, it, it makes a powerful change and transition from what he used to do, uh, which I think would have been worth it. But yeah. Absolutely. And when you think about a Christmas Carol, Ebenezer Scrooge is an elderly person. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's been that way. And, and Dickens himself is saying, you're never too old to change. And yeah. even though, I mean, you could say about Ebenezer Scrooge, he's already lost the woman that he loved. You know, he lost his business partner. Um, he doesn't seem to have any friends. I mean, in so many ways, you could say it's too late, but he was making that case. And this, of course, is before th- this letter exchange is going on. Mm-hmm. He himself believes it's never too late to change. And then he lived what he said. He lived what he said. And just, you know, I, I-, I share Eliza Davis's admiration for him. And it's, it's a reminder to all of us. It's never too early. It's never too late to do the right thing. Yeah. I mean, even if it turns out it's the last day of your life, I mean, it's never too late to, to make that change uh, and, exactly. and to be a good person. Right. Well, I, I could talk with you all day long if we had time, but <laughs> I, I appreciate it. I love this book so much and uh, I'm going to really just try to um, promote it uh, here on the show, especially and wherever I can. It's, it's got a powerful message. I do like to end with uh, three questions and, and we'll, we'll just start with the big one. We've talked about it this whole episode, but do you personally have a story in your life that you realized that words have power? Absolutely. It goes back to, to, to dear Mr. Dickens. I mean, her words, again, she wrote the letter I had dreamed of writing, you know, I couldn't have done it unless, unless I went back in time, but to the fact that she had actually written, it was such a surreal experience to know that someone had written the letter I dreamed of writing, but to know that her letters could have this impact on him. And then his, because of that, then his words would have impact on readers in England. And when you look at how English laws changed during those years, um, how uh, during those years, you suddenly Jewish people who weren't even allowed to be in parliament were now allowed to be in parliament and even could take their seat um, with with the Bible and not with the New Testament. That, that had never happened before. Mm-hmm. And it happened because he took a part in changing minds and hearts. And it was because Eliza Davis had done that for him. And why? It's not because of money. It's not because of influence. Um, it wasn't because of a war. It was simply because of the words she used in her letters that changed his heart. The words he used in his book that changed the hearts of the readers in England. I, I, I'm, I don't know. I, words are failing. I mean, it's such a powerful moment, I, I think, in his life that, and, and what Eliza did, just a great example uh, just, just to say something, speak up because our words do have power. Um, and I must really... also say that these words were healing for my mother and me because this mm. was, we were always like this. And, you know, it was always, you know, my mother and I were just so close and so bonded by the books and, and we always were close, but this was something that we never, it was like a little schism, a place where we just couldn't see eye to eye. And when I was able to put this book in her hands, it was like a little, wound that that healed and not only closed but it kind of bloomed into something more beautiful because it restored something that she had lost as a child through the pain of the holocaust that belief that people are good at heart that Mm -hmm. people can change that people um can do better and this reminded her that yes people can and the look on my mother's face the look in her eyes the healing that took place. I I mean, I could see through the sparkle in her eyes or the tears that came down that her heart was healing Mm. to know this story. And so that was a beautiful thing for me that these words were able to do personally close to home. Man, I'm getting shivers. That's (laughs) such a powerful story. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that. Any writing tips for any, uh, we probably have some, up and coming writers who listen and and want some advice. Do you have any, any advice for a a new writer? I think that the the most important advice I can give to anybody is to think about what you truly want in your heart to share 
with the world, with the readers. I think, I think you can get very lost if you are trying to predict what people want to read or what is going to be the next big hit or, um, and I, I don't know that that ever takes you to really where you want to go. I think you have to think what it is that you have to share, that you want to share with the world. I mean, Dear Mr. Dickens is a very unlikely book. Mm. Again, what do I have? I have an adult protagonist. <laughs> um, yeah. I have a story about letters. I have a book that I, that came out of a, a, a that was in that uh, its roots were in a academic article I saw where I had to quote it from the letters and I had to track down the full letters. <laughs> um, there were so many reasons why that shouldn't have worked. But again, I had taken my, I knew what it meant to me to know about this. I knew what it mm. meant to my mother. I knew that I wanted kids, what I wanted kids to know about the power of words and the power of, um, of, of, of speaking up and the power of forgiveness and love and doing better. And so I just knew I had to write this story. And I knew also I was going to stick with it until it found a home. And I think it's so deeply satisfying for that reason. And so many of my books um, were unlikely for various reasons. <laughs> Because I tend not to write about the most famous people. So right. many of my books are about people who have never had books written about them before. But I write about the people I want kids to know about. And I just encourage you to do that and to find your own way of telling the story. It doesn't have to be the way everybody else wrote it. You, do, you don't have to. What, what was that great quote? Um, and I'm, I'm having trouble attributing to it. I mean, you might as well be yourself. Everyone else is taken. Yeah. <laughs> find find your own voice write your own story um you, yep. you don't have to yes uh you don't have to be even like the people that you admire your voice is unique what you have to say is unique find that work and don't expect that it's going to come out right the first time i rewrite all the time it takes a long time sometimes for what is in your heart to match what you're actually putting on the page but there'll come a point where it's close enough where you have something to go out and share. Well said. Yeah. And then uh, one final question here, uh, because we, I do like to have book recommendations. Uh, is there anything you've been reading lately that you, you, you'd you recommend uh, for us to read? I, my sister, um, who has been like such a big support to me in my writing career mm -hmm. um, and it, encouraging me. She gave me this book that I, it's just extraordinary. It's called It Rained Warm Bread. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's Moisha Moskowitz's story of surviving the Holocaust. You know, and I have to say, like, I kind of resisted it at first. I went, oh gosh, there mm -hmm. are so many stories about, uh, you know, this subject matter. And I read so many. But this is so beautiful. And it's not only that the story is so beautiful, but the way it was done, the story came from Moisha Moskowitz's daughter, Gloria Moskowitz Sweet. And she entrusted the story to a poet named Hope Anita Smith. And mm -hmm. so the whole book, all the memories are written in the form of poem so it's a narrative story but poem by poem so it's written in such a way every word the metaphors that come through this sense of him growing up among wolves um this sense uh, his describing of wearing the star but the star had the jewish star that they were forced to wear but no light um it, it is just so moving and it reminds us of the power of poetry to tell stories in a way that goes straight to the heart, the, the power of metaphor, not to be precious, but to tell the truth in a more profound way. I am really struck not only by the story and, the, uh, and how it conveys the emotions, the, the fear, the terror, but also the love and the hope. And it's all intertwined and it's told with such honesty uh, and the power of poetry, uh, every word here 
shines and it's just an inspiration for me, you know, going forward as to a fresh way of, of how to tell stories in an, in an honest, in a beautiful way. I had one I was going to recommend, but it's nowhere near as heartfelt as that one. But uh, that, that sounds that sounds amazing. Uh, but I I was I've been reading um, a book about Dickens actually right now. It's called The Artful Dickens by John Mullen, I think is his last name, and it just covers different um, themes that Dickens would write about and how it appears in his in his works. And I I really found that to be a, a opening to to want to go back and read all of the books again now to catch these things you know he, he writes about um looks at how he write about sense and, and smell and you know the, the ghost ghostly parts of his book uh, today i just read the chapter on on humor which dickens is full of humor so he is uh, so funny <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> especially uh, uh the pickwick papers is one of my favorites uh and that's of course his first one it's very a very comic novel but um, much of the humor still translates well today. Uh, that's one of my you know, favorites. I, you know, I can't wait. I'm so glad you recommended that art because I, I can't wait to get that myself. And you know, one of my favorite books growing up was Little Women by Louisa May mm-hmm. Alcott. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but like, um, but Joe and her and her sisters, they would all act out the Pickwick papers. Yeah. I mean, the, all these chapters where they would take on the different characters and you realize how popular the Pickwick papers were in America. And so you would have all of these, it was, it was part of little women that they would all act out these characters and go on adventures and um, Mm -hmm. how much fun they had with it. I mean, he was just, he was just amazing that he created these characters that captured the imagination that got people so excited. I don't know if there's ever really been his like in terms of inspiring people and then he drew people in so that you would really listen to what he had to say. And just when you're sort of laughing and having fun with it, then, you know, he's mm. saying something that makes you really think. Yeah. That's I, something I was, more profound. Yeah. I was just listening to a podcast. Um, they were interviewing uh, Lucinda Hoxley, <gasps> one, one of his descendants, you know. And, she wrote to me. She oh, wrote she did. to me about oh, the book. She thanked that's... me for writing, dear Mr. Dickens. I was so honored. Oh my goodness, that's oh, awesome. Yes. <laughs> well, talk about burying the lead. Wow. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, no, that's great. Oh, uh, that's amazing. But yeah, she said that um, uh, you know that Dickens often would be criticized for being overly sentimental and everything. But she said, but the truth of the matter was that the situations he wrote about were awful. I mean, they were so bad that, yeah. you know, he was often, he wasn't necessarily being, you know, overly mawkish and sentimental. He was just writing what was actually happening and, and then people's response to that, you know, she thought maybe it was because they were feeling so bad about, uh, about that, that they kind of were like, oh, well, that's, you're just being sentimental, you know, and they brush it off because they didn't want to deal with it. Well, no, and you know what? He started out as a journalist, and mm-hmm. I think he brought a journalist's eye even to his fiction. I mean, you see that description, all those descriptions. I mean, you know, I mean, we were talking about Ike Solomons, like the mm-hmm. who's probable model for Fagin. You know, he's reading about this guy, and he's just so good at describing people the way a journalist would, except of course he's fictionalizing them, and he was really describing dire situations that were going on in his community. I mean, somebody else might have done a newspaper article about it. He brought them to life in a fictionalized way and um, got people to empathize and care with the, care about the, you know, the people who were suffering and dying because of these unfair social system and the social castes. And no, I I think he did... uh, such important work and he made people better Mm -hmm. absolutely and uh what a great challenge for all of us to to try to be better every day and treat each other with respect and dignity and we can slowly but surely make some great changes in our world i think Uh, i hope so yeah nancy thank you so much for coming on and and sharing your passion with us Uh, i i'm again a huge fan of Charles Dickens and I absolutely love this book. Oh, so am I. Um, oh, thank you, Art. I appreciate that. This is a great one. Even if you're a grown up like me, read it. It's it's a short and powerful story. 
Thank you so much, Arden. I'm so grateful for all you do. For, you know, the light you shine on books and, and I'm just, I'm just so honored that, and I'm, I'm thankful to the person who brought this to your attention. And I thank you for bringing it to your listeners' attention. Um, you know, as you could tell, Eliza Davis is close to my heart and I'm a, again, a, probably mm. an even bigger Charles Dickens fan for having known um, about his great ability to uh, be even better than I thought he was. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm so glad for people to know this about him as well. And that maybe it will inspire others to, um, to be their best selves. We can always, no matter how, even those of us who have, uh, who have evolved can evolve more. And I think that's, that's sort of a little bit of this lesson mm -hmm. too. Yep. Well, if you want to read another review of this book, uh, and I mentioned this to you, uh, the review I came across is from the Dickens blog. It's from the March 20th um, posting called From the Book Pile. And uh, the, uh, her name is Gina Delfonso, and she runs that blog and has a Facebook page. And it's it's a great place for all of us Dickens dickens nerds to, to gather so <laughs> I'll, I'll post a link for it in the show notes and you can read uh, gina's uh review post a link for all the books we've talked about today and uh nancy again thank you thank you thank you for coming on thank Appreciate you art it. this is such a pleasure thank you, you. Bet. yep well you take care well thank you for listening now i might be taking a short break on the podcast as i have some uh, vacation time coming up and some planning and tinkering I want to do with the podcast and uh, getting ready for season two I think so I'll take a short break but not to worry I will be back got some author interviews lined up already and some others I'm reaching out to and I'm hoping to put together a great second season of the podcast in the meantime I will be posting some booktube videos that I got behind on I've got some book tag videos I want to do so if you haven't subscribed yet, this is your chance to, to hit that subscribe button and the bell notification so that uh, you can be sure to catch all the videos that I will be putting out in the days ahead. I'm really excited about some of the content I have planned, and I can't wait uh, to get them out to you. Um, in the meantime, if you'd like to help support the podcast, uh, you can buy me a coffee. Any donations made goes to uh, equipment and podcast hosting, things of that nature. I couldn't do this without you, so thank you so much. So until next time, I just want to remind you that our words and stories have power, and you should share yours. Take care.